everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest tonight is Dr. Terry Mason. He appeared in the hit documentary Forks Over Knives, and he is a nationally known health educator and inspirational speaker. He champions holistic approaches to health management, the role of families in building healthier communities, and the elimination of health disparities for underserved communities. A board-certified urologist, Dr. Mason has enjoyed a 30-plus year career in medical practice and currently serves as Chief Medical Officer of the Cook County Health System. His radio show, Doctor in the House, airs on WVON 1690 AM radio each week, and he is a frequent guest on local and national television shows and radio programs. Please welcome my friend, Dr. Terry Mason. Thank you, Chef, Chef AJ, and it's really a pleasure to be yeah. on the call with you tonight. I really, really appreciate it, and I just want to let everyone know how much I appreciate you in terms of what you've been able to do to help expose me to some of the people I probably not would have been able to be exposed to. And we had a great time in Marshall, Texas. Absolutely. We had a great time when we were at the, the plant-based nutrition meeting. We just... Just a great, great time, and you're a wonderful chef. And I hope that you get a chance to talk a little bit about the green line and the red line tonight. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do that, because you know. But but thank you. But that this call is about you. But I feel the same way. When people ask me to recommend a speaker, you're on the short list because you're not only knowledgeable and an expert in your field, but you're just so fun to hang out with. You know. I mean, <laughs> but and what you talk about, you know, it's so interesting because I met you four years ago at the premiere of Forks Over Knives, and I just thought you were just such a, you were just so pleasant and so joyful, and I just wanted to meet you, and you were just you were everything you were on the film, and I wanted to ask you how did that come about because before forks or knives i'm going to be honest i never heard about you but you were one of my favorite parts in the movie when you said if it if it wiggles a fan or shakes the hook, <laughs> so it walks funny. hops crawls flies swims has eyes of mom and a daddy that's what i said <laughs> yeah, you were just such a delightful part of the movie how did brian wendell even find you well what happened was that i had been commissioner of health for the city of chicago and I had asked the mayor for permission to ask the entire city of Chicago, coming out of the season of gluttony, which starts on Thanksgiving Day and goes yep. all the way to January 1st, to as a, as a way to begin to call attention to heart, heart disease and diabetes and obesity, to ask people to abstain from eating meat for 30 days. That is from January 2nd to January 31st. And he agreed. And there was a full-page article in, in the Chicago Tribune, I believe it was, that talked about that. And we got people together, and some of the people that are on the phone are people that, God, that goes way back. I said, I, I was at the city in, two, I think I did that 2006 or 2007. And uh, there have been people that have really followed that since that time. And I think Brian and those guys got wind of it because, they were unable to find a public official anywhere around the country who openly endorsed a plant-based way of eating. And for me, it was a no-brainer because all of the diseases that we were struggling with, and to your point, the one that as a urologist I dealt with in addition to prostate cancer was male erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And there is a direct relationship between male erectile dysfunction and the kinds of things that we eat. Sure, and we'll I'm, get into that a little bit more. Absolutely. That's, I can't wait to get into that. So what, what do you, you know, I mentioned to the Reverend before you came on the line that I'm actually born and raised in Chicago. What is it that you actually do there in this job you have as chief operating officer? Well, right now I run the, the health department for the county of Cook. Mm -hmm. um, and Cook County is about totally about 5 million people, wow. but it's divided between Chicago, which is in Cook County, and they have their own health department, and the rest of what we call suburban Cook County. And what I'm doing right now, in fact, we had a meeting today, and that is really to think about what are we going to do as a public health department to really think about a new way to talk about obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and so on and so forth. And I'm really grateful to all of the people who have been on that are on the line from Chicago who have really sort of been the support, the wind beneath my wings. Reverend Lassiter representing 
the um, Acts of Faith, and there are several churches, small and large, in the Acts of Faith. And we've really been trying to move this through the faith community because we, we, we have a lot of things that we do, and then many of them are inconsistent with one of the things that we believe as, as, as Christian people, and that is that we should, you know, above all things, we should prosper. And mm-hmm. part of that prospering is really in health. Yep. And we're not doing that. And so I think that it's important that we in public health team up with all of our partners, people like you, people like Reverend Lassiter, people like those people on the phone, like my star supporter, Ms. Flora, who has come to everything that we've done. And there, there are people out there, and I'm convinced, that want to know better so they can do better. And it's just that we haven't done that. We haven't put it out that way for them. And I'm only too happy to be on this call tonight to be able to do more of it. Well, terrific. Now, you know, we just got back from a wonderful event called the Health Fest in Marshall, Texas, and the title of your talk was, It's Not Just About the Penis. But I might disagree. I think it is just about the penis. <laughs> just nice. Because one of the things, you were great in Forks Over Knives, but you were even maybe better in the extended interview uh, DVD of it. And one of the things you said in that DVD, which I quote all the time, is you say, if you have vascular disease anywhere, you have it everywhere. And that erectile dysfunction is actually the first clinical indicator of generalized cardiovascular disease. So please explain that to our listeners, especially the male ones for whom this could be very important. Well, yeah, this is this is a wonderful, wonderful thing, and I appreciate you asking the question. And many of the people on have heard me lecture about this, and it's because in my career as a urologist, I dealt a lot with men with erectile dysfunction. And one of the things, to make the short story, is that none of the things that I was doing, whether it was giving them pills like the ones that we all know about, or if it was making them learning, teaching them how to use medicines they could either inject into their penis or put down the the urinary tract that uh, would diffuse into the chambers of the penis that were responsible for erection, or as a last resort, actually putting in inflatable devices into the penis to create wow. erection. None of those things, none of them did one thing to actually address the true cause of their impotence. And part of that is the same issue that when we use coronary stents or bypass surgery, and by the way, when you need that in an emergency, you should by all means have it. But when we do a stent or when we do bypass surgery, we still don't do anything to help arrest the cause of the disease. And so when we look at the cause of the disease, and of course, Dr. Esselstyn uh, and Dr. T. Colin Campbell, but Dr. Esselstyn wrote the book, How to Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And in that book, those 16 patients or so that he took through that very strict diet of a whole food, plant-based, no oil, no nuts diet, and they reversed their heart disease, that's because the damage is done by what we eat to the lining cells of our blood vessels called the endothelial cells. Mm -hmm. And those endothelial cells are damaged when we eat, according to Dr. Campbell, uh, lots of animal-based protein. And according to Dr. Esselstyn, even those things like oils and processed foods and, of course, cholesterol. And when the body gets those substances in them, that goes into the bloodstream. And if it goes into the bloodstream, it goes everywhere. And the reason why it creates impotence is because a lot of those endothelial cells are inside the penis and they are necessary in order for the erection to occur. And because there's so many of them in a very small area of the small area like inside the penis, and because these things that we're eating damage the endothelial cells, they that problem shows up earlier in the penis than it does anywhere else. Well, that would and make there's, sense. Yeah. That so, would... yeah, so the, the, the thing that we, we look at is that when we look at the, the, the science and we see that those people who have 
erectile dysfunction. In other words, there was a study done that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2005, and that's some time ago, so this is not new information. But when they looked at men, and they looked at men who had a heart attack, and in this particular study, there was about 571 men that had had a heart attack. Well, what they found when they questioned these men is that 464 of them had had erectile dysfunction before they had a heart attack. Wow. They also found in 181 men who had a stroke, 157 of them had erectile dysfunction before they had their stroke. And for 457 men that died, 382 of them had erectile dysfunction before then. And when you adjust it, just to, you know, because you could say, well, all of them drank water. Did they die from drinking water? No. If you adjust, the, if you ju- there's a way to statistically single out whether or not that particular event, that erectile dysfunction, is definitely related to their heart attacks or their strokes or death to any cause. That's what we call adjusting for what we call covariates. That is, other things that could be are uh, responsible. And when you do that. You can single out the one thing that you want, and that has been shown to be a very powerful indicator. And so I would say for any man out there who has erectile dysfunction, you are also at risk. In some cases, uh, it's over 50% higher risk for developing a heart attack. With regard to a stroke, according to the data, you are at a much higher risk even for a stroke. And that's at at least almost 80% higher. This is important. So it is, this, is, this is really, really, really important. Absolutely. And because men, because of what they do, all of the medicines never treat the underlying problem. It does not repair those endothelial cells. It just takes one of the chemical reactions that cause the nitric oxide to be uh, produced. Mm -hmm. It blocks a a chemical that breaks that down. So in other words, it makes it hang around longer. But but because no medicine only does one thing, Mm -hmm. that's why you get the blue tinge in the the eyesight. Sometimes you'll get pain. Sometimes you'll relax the lower esophageal sphincter, which is a little muscle that keeps your food in your stomach and keeps it from coming back up your esophagus, causing heartburn. So, And then some of them also affect other parts of the body. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. And, that's, and the beautiful thing is that when we begin to eat a plant, whole food plant-based diet, as Dr. Esselstyn showed in his book, if you could reduce the blockages in the heart, then you could also begin to reverse some of the problems in the penis. Now, you can't have eaten, you know, 50,000 bad meals over 60 years and expect to eat two good ones and everything gets better. It doesn't work quite like that. Right. It, it takes a long time to do this. You know, it's amazing because I, I know about Viagra. That's the drug that I, that I think of mostly for this condition. But I didn't realize that there was also injectable medicine that people were injecting in this penis and, and pumps. I mean, that can't be very pleasant or convenient for the user, I, I can't imagine, you know. No, it isn't. But for, and I'll tell you, AJ, one of the things that's very, what people need to understand that there's nothing that goes to the core of attacking a man's feeling about his manhood mm-hmm. than not being able right. to have an erection. Right. And, and and so this is one of the reasons why I went into this field because I really wanted to help men uh, deal with that. And, and the other thing was we started a group actually a long time ago where in a, in a book that I wrote called Making Love Again where we actually used to set up a support group for both men and women to come and talk about this because early on in the early early 80s we didn't know what we knew today or what you right. know today and there were no drugs and there was nothing else we used to tell guys all it was in their head but that's not true yeah. and so if you think about how miseducated men are 
when you Google the mentally manliest places to eat in America, oh. you find places where they have huge amounts of meat that people eat. And let's face it, the only place you get cholesterol is from animal products. Yep. It's the only place. Right. That, it's just, you know, I want to say to everybody, if you want to avoid taking that little blue pill, just start eating a, a few of those green leaves, you know, because. <laughs> that, well, you know, I tell them, I said, if you want to get it up in the bedroom, keep the grease out of the kitchen. Oh, that's great. That, <laughs> that, 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 well, are you the one that says that the, 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 the stiffer the arteries, the softer the penis? Was that you? No, that wasn't me. I didn't say that, but, but I'll, 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 I'll take it though. But I didn't, I, that, that, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put that out there, but. I think that the the thing that we have to get people to see, and the other part, the other part which we don't know as much about, but to the extent that clitoral, for the clitoris to become erect, for a woman to have an orgasm, the same thing can happen to them. Interesting. So everyone needs to eat healthy, not just the men. Every everybody, everybody should be. And well, first of all, we should not ha- we should not have unhealthy eating. That's true. So it should be. We, I'd hope to see the day in America where we talked about eating and it was synonymous with eating right, because right now when you have to eat, you say eating, you have to qualify what you're talking about. If they're even eating food, in other words. Yeah. If they're eating, and what's happening in the food industry, Chef AJ, as you know, as a chef, they are moving people further and further away from the earth, from the source of production, and they're creating food that has little sometimes to do with the way that food is naturally produced. Sure. It's, they're making food in a plant instead of eating food that's coming from a plant. Oh, I like that one. That's yes. that's absolutely Thank right. You. Thank you. So you, you talked a lot about these endothelial cells, as did as does Dr. Esselstyn, and I really paid attention to your interview in Forks Over Knives, and what what you said was that, let me see, because I, I took really extensive notes, because I think a lot of people don't know exactly what these endothelial cells are, but you said that inside the penis, you have the highest per cross-sectional area of these specialized cells called endothelial cells, and endothelial cells are what are responsible for the, uh, what, I can't read my handwriting, initiation of increased blood flow and storage of blood in the penis to create an erection, and the diseases that damage the endothelial cells are diabetes, high blood pressure, and elevated cholesterol. So these endothelial cells, it sounds like they're super important, especially for this, uh, you know, for the penis. We have them everywhere, right? We have them everywhere. And that's why I said blood, uh, any problem anywhere, I mean, a problem with the blood anywhere is problem, I mean, a problem with the artery anywhere is a problem with the arteries everywhere. Sure. So it's, if you look at when we start talking about a heart disease, you say, well, what are the risk factors? Well, smoking, diabetes, obesity. Then you say, well, what are the risk factors for a heart attack? Smoking, diabetes, obesity. What are the risk factors for peripheral vascular disease or blocking up of the arteries that supply the blood to your legs and feet and arms? Smoking, diabetes, obesity. Well, what are the risk factors even for cancer? Smoking, diabetes. Yeah. So there's a reason why that's that way. Yeah. There's a reason, and, and you know, what we think, what, our, what the medical profession has done is compartmentalize these things and make us think that they're different, but they're not. For example, you know, if a person has a heart attack, then they're just, just as equally likely to have a stroke. Why? Because if the block, heart, arteries on the heart are blocked up, don't you think the ones in the brain are probably blocked up? Sure, Don't sure. you think the ones that feed the leg are also blocked up? Because it's the same disease. It's in the right. same place. It's caused by the same problem. And we've got to stop thinking of these things as different and see them for what they are, and that's the same. And, they're ca- and the cause is the same. It's the food. The so causes are the same because right. it's the same disease. Yeah, so and the- to the extent that cancers... You know, we, we talk about cancer of the breast, cancer of the colon, cancer of the lung. Well, notice the first word is what? Cancer. Mm-hmm. And so what I say, and eventually what kills, what many times kills people with cancer, is that it spreads all over the body. Well, how does it do that? The blood carries it. Sure. So there are certain organs where we may start with this, but it's certainly not the end. And any uh, any organ with cancer anywhere 
can also provide an opportunity for that cancer to be seeded everywhere. Sure. We call that prostate, we call that process metastasis. Sure. So sure. we have to stop thinking about these things. And if the, there's a, a real big move afoot, Chef AJ, to keep us from looking at the singular or one of the major causes of a problem because no one wants to tackle that. Mm-hmm. But that's what I'm so glad that you do and – Essie does and what T. Collin and all the people. And, of course, we had these amazing athletes at the conference oh, in yeah. Marshall sure. who were just phenomenal. I mean, men that were running 100 miles and all kinds of stuff, <laughs> eating a plant-based diet. Right. And what, what, what I think Colin says is so true is that we forget. People think that protein is a synonymous with meat. And everything that people eat for protein, from a meat point of view, none of those animals eat meat as protein. I know. Isn't that interesting? I always, I always wondered about that. You, you look you at the glutes on a horse. The horse has some of the most, the <laughs> biggest and most powerful glutes that you can see, but he's bent over eating or she's bent over eating yeah. grass. And they have no erectile dysfunction. And as a matter of fact, there's a saying, <laughs> I'm like a horse. <laughs> that's what happens when you eat plants. You said that you found that the risk factors for erectile dysfunction were the same as they were for stroke and the same as they were for heart disease, the same as they were for everything else. But yet, way in the past, they didn't seem to realize this. When did that come about when they were starting to make the connection? Actually, we we worked through that uh, thanks to the work of guys like Emil Tanago at the University of California and Tom Liu, his fellow at the time, and guys like Irv Goldstein, and there are a number of people all over the country that began to lay out what this, how this thing worked. But we, th- this, it, this, all of this came came to pass in the '80s, late mid mid to late '80s, uh, that that the, the real process of how erections happen. And we actually convened a National Medical Association, a group of urologists and cardiologists and internists and endocrinologists, because it was like, okay, why don't we, we're all talking about the same thing. In fact, I'm doing a talk for the National Medical Association this year, where we're really going to get to this thing about what the single, where, where is this all going? And it's real, we got to stop looking for all these different things and look at the one thing, and that one thing is food. And food is at the core of every single disease process that we have. So that means if bad food is at the core of disease, Mm -hmm. then good food is at the core of cure. And now I imagine, because you're a little bit older than I am, that you probably didn't get a lot of nutritional training when you went to medical school. I had 40 minutes in four years. Wow. (laughs) And actually one of the things that at the public health level that we want to do and some people have already started, and that is to survey medical schools for how much nutritional training they're going to give the doctors. Same thing should be true for nurses. But more importantly, unfortunately, doctors, even if they know, there's, no, there's not a good way for them to be able to take the time that they need to teach the patients because the insurance companies, even the federal government, doesn't pay for that kind of counseling. Patients who are undergoing surgery and and undergoing treatment for their cancers, they're even at higher risk because the medications they take for chemotherapy, the procedures that we do for surgery create a tremendous shock to the body and you really need it in an optimal nutritional condition. And just giving people a can of some drink to take is, is not adequate. Yeah, and we need to think about how we can begin to treat more of these problems by restoring the right nutritional balance, as Dr. Esselstyn proved in his book. In the Forks Over Knives Extended Interviews, you said that you can eat yourself into poor health and early death, or you can eat yourself into good health and a long life. And that road is on a plant-centered diet, dietary pattern, exercise, good mental uh, food, resting, so you didn't learn this in medical school. When did you learn this, and when did you yourself start adopting a plant-based diet? Well, in fact, when I was uh, interviewed for the movie Forks Over Knives, I was sitting at Soul Vegetarian Restaurant here in Chicago, oh, a vegetarian perfect. restaurant that was started uh, through the community of the Hebrew Israelites, 
has been in business for over 30 years, right on the south side of Chicago. In fact, I stopped there last night. <laughs> but uh, it was it was actually after I spent some time with them, I actually went over to Israel and spent time in Israel, spent time with the community in Israel at the time. And it was after that that my transformation began because I saw guys out there in Israel in Demona at that time playing basketball that were in their 60s, and they were playing with guys that were 30 years younger than them in the hot sun. Wow. And I'm like, these guys are doing something right. <laughs> They're really doing something right. And and people weren't plagued with a lot of the diseases that we saw in their counterparts in America, particularly those that were born and raised and were just the only diets their mothers knew, their fathers knew, and they knew was a plant-based diet. That's and true. you could see the difference. You could see the difference. And even though they were from the same genetic pool, uh, I recall that I think it was Howard University, I don't I remember all the data, went down and measured and tried to see what the differences were. And they found significantly different, if I remember correctly, cholesterol levels and things of that nature. So that was the beginning, you know, and like everything else, I didn't do it all at one time. I didn't wake up and say, okay, I'm never going to do this. No, I, I, it was, it was a process. And I think that that's what we need to understand for people that you, you don't do this. Many people don't do this all at once. Some do, but some decide, decide to cut back on beef and then they may cut back on their chicken and, because it's been such a part of who we are, mm-hmm. and it's and you and you can't get away from it now with big screen televisions. You're yeah. sitting at home and you can see a 60 inch hamburger, so <laughs> so uh, or rotisserie chicken, and it 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 makes it very very difficult. And we're paying, according to Cowspiracy, a very large environmental cost for this. Sure. Absolutely. Destroying the planet. The rainforest already has been compromised. You know, you mentioned television. You know, it's only in the last few years that you even started seeing commercials for erectile dysfunction. You know, that wasn't something you used to see growing up on TV. And I love when they say, if you have an erection lasting over four hours, call your physician. I'm thinking, just call me. I'll be right over, you know. (laughs) Well, the reason they do that and the reason why that's important is that the blood... If it is trapped in the penis from these medications for too long, normally during erection, the blood is still moving sort of through the penis. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, it's, although it's held there with some pressure, but at some point, the tissues become, can become damaged and the blood does not get out. And that results in a very painful situation and then the oxygen levels drops, and it can actually damage the penis far more severely than one knows. And that's as a result of that, you can get scarring inside the penis where the endothelial cells now become permanently damaged. Ooh. And even after, and sometimes we have to put in medication to reverse the erection, wow. but even then sometimes those tissues can be irrevocably uh, damaged, irrevocably damaged. These medications are not without side effects. I love how you call uh, erectile dysfunction the canary in the coal mine. Right. I do that because that's exactly what it is. And any man who is suffering from this should, should really know that they're at risk for heart attack, stroke, congestive heart failure, because this is all the same problem. Yeah. And I would say to, to, to a man, you know, again, not with the expectation that you can eat a, a plate of greens tonight and, and perform like Superman, no. But from the expectation that you need to do this to help improve your overall health and your sexual health will improve as well. So we have arteries and endothelial cells, it sounds like, everywhere in the body, but do they get clogged first in the smaller arteries of the penis than they say in, in larger areas of the body? Well, the, that's a great question. The arteries, the large arteries, actually have the endothelial cells damaged. Mm-hmm. And what happens is 
depending upon where it is and what happens in the heart. Because you guys remember that by the time somebody's 40 years old or so, their heart's probably beaten over a billion times. Wow. So the heart only gets gets a chance to rest in between beats. And so it it has a very high demand for the oxygen that's carried by the blood to the muscle of the heart. And when we damage it by using these, when we damage it by eating the wrong stuff, what happens is the body is actually trying to repair that damage. So it puts a clot on top of it, mm. and sometimes the clot can break away and go down the artery and get caught in another area where some of the cholesterol has damaged the artery, and then the blood can't get past that, and all of the tissue served by that particular blood vessel becomes severely damaged and sometimes can even die. And it's only when the heart muscle is damaged that a test like an electrocardiogram is going to show anything. Mm -hmm. So you could go in the doctor's office and get an EKG and it will be normal, and it means absolutely nothing. You could walk outside and drop dead of a heart attack still. Right, because you, you had said that a lot of times that in, I think, over 50% of the people that sometimes the first sign of heart disease could be a fatal heart attack. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And all of us either know someone or that, know somebody who has known or heard that someone just suddenly died. Like like James Gandolfini, who played Tony Soprano, remember? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Just suddenly died from a massive heart attack. Well, what did that mean? That meant that the blood vessel that serves the left side of the heart, particularly the left side of the bottom part of the heart, there's one artery that there's a, there's a several arteries, but if that artery is blocked way upstream so that when it's blocked, all of the left side of the heart doesn't get blood anymore, boom, that's it. That's your, and you don't get chest pain or any of that stuff. And that's why I like to say that chest pain, angina, that sort of stuff where you get the pressure in the chest, pain going down the left arm, shortness of breath, sweating, maybe some palpitations, and they talk about that as an early warning sign. No, that's not early. That's late. That's late. Early warning sign may be the erectile dysfunction. Early warning sign might be going to your doctor and getting a what's called an inflammatory panel to look at in the blood if there are enough things circulating that are causing the damage, like the different lipids, like your bad cholesterol, and there are other things that we can now measure to determine how much inflammation is going on. And if those things are elevated, whether you have chest pain or not, see, that's, that's too late. Sure. That's way too late. Right, because one of the things you said is that we wait for symptoms, but that we don't have symptoms until we already have severe vascular disease. Exactly, and I don't, and I, I think symptoms is an arcane, Byzantine, medieval, <laughs> backwards, stupid way of talking about disease. And the reason why I say that so emphatically is that there's not one disease, not one, that produces a symptom in its earliest stage. Not one. Right. What about asthma? By the time that you get a symptom, huh? you've got problems. Yeah. I was just thinking of like, cause you, I was just trying to challenge you. You said there's not one disease that produces a symptom in its early stage. What about asthma? Doesn't that produce a symptom in its early stage? Like no, because by the time you start getting enough restriction of air, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Right. You're, you're right. I was just trying to, I was just trying to play devil's advocate and thinking of every disease I could to see if they, uh, if I could think. I mean, of but you just think about it. Most of them, I'm not saying you're at the end of the line, mm -hmm. but by the time you get, symptomatic from a restrictive airway problem. In other words, your bronchial tubes are are closing up and you're not able to get enough oxygen. And asthma is a great example because no one should play with the asthma. People die every day from asthma. Oh my god. Because those those bronchial tubes can tighten up sometimes so much yes. that even your little inhaler won't open it and especially young people play around. I, I have the unfortunate situation where one of my good friends lost his 21-year-old son to mm -hmm. asthma because, you know, the kids think they could just you keep using their inhaler. But if you're using that inhaler more than once a week, there's a problem. Shoot. 
Yeah, I, you know, I didn't mean to diminish the seriousness of that disease because we recently lost two prominent vegans both to that disease, and I, I, I don't take that lightly at all. So I'm, I'm very sorry about your friend's kid. Well, so one of the things I like that you said is that you debunked the myth about a plant-based diet being more expensive, and you said if you ever compared a b- price of a bag of beans with the price of a ribeye steak, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we most of us and many of the people that are probably on the phone – know that, well, I grew up in a household with a lot of kids, and oftentimes a big pot of beans, maybe even with a neck bone or something in there, but a big pot of beans and rice was oftentimes what we ate. That was that was it. Mm-hmm. And rice and beans are, they're, they're complete proteins. They will, they will keep you full. They give you stabilized, and they give you good fiber, and they give you good protein. Right. And that's they're delicious, actually. Too. And it's cheap. And that's, it's cheap. Right. Rice is still very cheap, relatively. And beans, dried beans, Absolutely. are still cheap, relatively yeah, I, speaking. I couldn't agree with you. You know, I'm going to be speaking next week in Oregon with Dr. Craig McDougal at a childhood obesity summit. And they said, well, you know, you have to realize that we're in, a, in an area where everybody's poor. And I'm like... Well, and I said the same thing. I said, so eat potatoes, you know. I mean, just because you you had said in the extended interview that poor people are poor in everything. And I think one of the things they're most poor in is the knowledge that they need to right. to, to to take control of their health. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So, so it's, you know, I, and, and, and I think that, but some of that I think is by design sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, people, people, I have a question, and I don't know when we'll get to the questions a little bit, but I have a question that somebody asked me about what's the best way to lose weight quickly and efficiently. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I think about that, and well, I'm going to let you answer that because I'd like to hear what you say. Well, you say, say. I think I think eating vegetables, eating fruits and vegetables, you know, I, I, calorie density, eating whole food found in nature, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. You can pretty much eat as much as you want, as often as you want until comfortably full. It's when you eat processed food and animal products, which Americans eat over 92 percent of their calories from, that you're going to have a problem because people that eat the diet consistent with their species natural history whole natural plant food, they're not overweight. And there's parts of the world where they're still eating this way and they're not overweight. You know, the only people that are overweight are human beings, domesticated, well, not people, but the only species that are overweight are domesticated dogs, domesticated cats, and humans because they're not eating their natural diet. They're eating processed food. You take away the processed food, whether it's, you know, vegan processed food or non-vegan processed food, and you're, you're going to gain health and lose weight. You, you don't have a choice. And and so that takes care of your high cholesterol and actually can help lower your blood pressure. Sure. It's a, it's win-win. It takes care of everything. So in addition to erectile dysfunction, you mentioned one of the other diseases that you saw a lot of was prostate cancer. So, mm-hmm. And I know Dean Ornish did a lot of work uh, with the heart, but also with the prostate. What are your thoughts about how this diet is going to affect the outcome of that disease or maybe not even see it anymore if people would follow? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, the the the, the, the study that looked at milk, and the relationship to prostate cancer, I thought was fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, and and basically, the the whole notion of animal based pros- uh, protein and cancer is what I think everybody should read in the China study, mm-hmm. because the China study by T. Colin Campbell, sh- Colin Campbell shows unequivocally that animal protein turned on cancer, and decreasing it and going to plant based protein turned it off. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. I, Dr. Michael Roizen, who I spoke with in Ohio, he he told a little funny story about how that when he does prostate exams, instead of using one finger, he likes to use two fingers because that way he has a second opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be, that, I thought that was that was rather cute. You know, if you don't mind. But 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 all kidding aside. Sure. There is there is significant information that I've been hearing late that really does look at this whole notion of anim, of animal protein. Again, I would challenge everyone who hasn't read it to get, get T. Collins' book because they did perhaps one of the most extensive studies that anyone has done and came to the conclusion that the Chinese, who are genetically pretty much out of the same stock, and they looked at all of these Chinese in different parts of China, and they did extensive food diaries, and they measured blood and urine, and they weighed them, and they did all kinds of stuff 
to come to the conclusion where people who ate more of a plant-based diet had fewer cancers. I don't know what else you need. Absolutely. I don't know why people um, are so unwilling to make these changes with the the, 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 wet, the breadth and depth of scientific information we have now. You know, I don't know a lot of people that suffer from prostate cancer, or at least that have shared it with me, but the few that I've known that have elected to have the surgery have ended up either impotent or incontinent or both. So let's talk a little bit about that because that's not pleasant, you know. No, no, and uh, there's a book written by Dr. Otis Browley called Do No Harm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Otis Browley is the chief medical officer for the American Cancer Society. He's a, he's a medical oncologist. That means he's the kind of doctor that gives chemotherapy for people with cancer. Mm -hmm. His father died, if I remember correctly, from, from prostate cancer. And Dr. Browley has always been a, an advocate for really make us, to make us think about the screening and all the stuff that we're doing for prostate cancer. And we focus on this one cancer so much. And, you know, there, I, I think there are a lot of things that we need to think about as we're looking at this. And, and I always say follow the money. And I'm not saying that people should not be involved or checking or in, engaged in the prostate cancer situation just as it is with breast cancer. But I think that, there's a lot of screening that's done, uh, and some people believe that that screening uncovers cancers that probably never would have killed or hurt anybody. Sure. Um, there are a lot of women who have breast biopsies that are not necessarily those those things that would have hurt or harmed them, and there's a lot of data coming out looking at both prostate cancer screening and breast ca and breast cancer. But in prostate cancer screening, we've changed that quite a bit over the last few years. And, and and we've also suggested that people over a certain age really rethink whether or not they should have a PSA because, you know, once you start down that path, it it takes you down mm -hmm. a road that could lead in surgery, and that's and that's not without risk. Yeah, and the absolutely. two risks that you mentioned, which yeah. are impotence and incontinence, are real. And they're not um, fun. Either neither of them are fun. So neither of them are fun. And the other thing is, is that the likelihood of what we call surgical cure. And I would implore that any man that has prostate cancer, and they have taken out the prostate can uh, taken out the prostate, to ask their doctor how far to the margin or the end of where the prostate was located. Did the, the the pathologist, the doctor that looked at the prostate under the microscope, see cancer cells? And if they say, well, they saw, they said the margin was clear. I'll say, but how clear? And they say, well, up to a millimeter. Well, one millimeter, really? Thirty percent. There's some data that shows that a, a la large percentage of the prostate cancers that come back come back right in the bed where the prostate used to be. So I'm not saying that people shouldn't have cancer uh, surgery or radiation or some sort of treatment, but I will say that they all need to know what their treatment really means. Mm -hmm. And what I would suggest and have suggested to everybody who's undergoing any kind of uh, procedure, whether it be cancer or anything else, is I've advocated to them that they should get to as much of a really certified, organic, whole food, plant-based diet as absolutely possible, because in my mind, that's the one of the best defenses yep. for keeping the cancer in check. Amen. So, Dr. Mason, I have a few questions from our listeners. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask them. Sure, go right in. One of them is uh, from someone who says that they are 99% recovered from many years of very painful interstitial cystitis because of eating plant-based, they no longer take medicine or have pain, and they can now eat most foods that used to trigger the IC, like tomatoes, citrus, and vinegar that they weren't able to eat before, and they look forward to eating small amounts of lemon one day soon. And the, the question asker wanted to know if you had, knew of any other people with interstitial cystitis who also had any kind of a wonderful recovery from eating a plant-based diet. Uh, no, because by the time I was in my practice, I had actually hired a female urologist to manage that particular disease. It is a really difficult disease. 
Uh, and at that time, I wasn't one who was doing a plant-based, and I didn't have partners that were doing it, mm-hmm. and I wasn't aware of anyone else that was doing it. So I don't know anyone other than this young lady who has had such a miraculous uh, recovery from it because this is a disease that people get pain when the bladder gets full. Wow. And it creates, it can be very excruciating pain, and uh, it they go through all kinds of issues. Uh, sometimes they can't control the bladder emptying, and if you can imagine, some of them are even using very, very powerful drugs. Uh, we used to use a drug called Elmiron. We used to over-distend the bladder. We used to, some people even use some uh, Botox in different places. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's really very difficult. So I'm glad to hear that she got significantly better on a mm-hmm. plant-based diet. Well, terrific. Thank you. The next question is from somebody who has been on a whole food plant-based diet for almost 40 years and says that, uh, when, that when they were 22 years old, which was 33 years ago, they were in an accident and fractured their spine and now have a neurogenic bladder. There's no symptoms other than when they cough or sneeze or see a funny movie, they leak urine. Is there any treatment for this? Man or woman? Uh, female. Female. Well, there are some drugs that people can use. I do am not, again, I've not been treating bladder issues with uh, foods. Uh, I'm not practicing. I've For the last 10 years now, I've been actually in the field of public health, mm-hmm. so I don't practice anymore. Sure. But certainly I would have that discussion, and you probably, you may not find someone who's doing it. And so with the under consultation, because you need to be certain that you're not leaking because you don't empty the bladder. Mm -hmm. And there are different tests. I'm sure she's probably had these tests called urodynamics Mm -hmm. that help to get an idea of exactly where the problems are in the bladder and to better define what might be something that they can do uh, because there's many different reasons why people uh, leak urine. And they need to make certain that they're not some of these other problems. So I would always advise them to at least be va- evaluated by a urologist. Sure. And whatever those parameters were, you get those done. And then if you go on a whole food plant-based diet and you can actually then document the changes, that would be very, very helpful, not just for you, but for a lot right. of other people. But um, the, the, the person that submitted the question said they've already been on a whole food plant-based diet for over 40 years. Right. Well, they should still have their condition okay. documented. Sure. Are there exercises us uh, females can do? Um, for Basically, our- Kegels. Those oh. are Kegel exercises. You know, where you mm-hmm. contract the muscles. Sure. Uh, in the in the, those those muscles in the pelvis, mm-hmm. uh, people can can do those. Uh, and obviously, if she's plant based, one thing I would also ask her to avoid um, are you know those particular foods that she finds that she leaks more with ah okay and not not to go to so many funny movies maybe see some <laughs> dramas again instead and oh. also make sure that her bladder wall hasn't fallen down Ooh. Uh, because sometimes that happens wow that does not sound so the, the 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 back wall of the bladder sits right above the vagina mm. and sometimes that can fall that can fall down that's called a cystocele and so that could also create a problem. Cool. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from a young lady who, maybe she's not young, it's a lady, though. She says that since Dr. Mason is a urologist, I thought he might have some insight in this area. I have Raynaud's and live in Alaska, so I'm looking for any available information on strengthening the vascular system. Well, I think the endothelial cells, the Raynaud's phenomenon, is a situation that's characterized by a few things, and sometimes it can get very, very difficult with uh, very, very sensitivity to cold. Alaska is probably the last place I want to live with a condition <laughs> like that. Uh, wow. But, but the thing that that I would say is that I would do all I could to optimize my endothelial cell health, and certainly, uh, plant whole food, plant based diet does that better than anything else. Absolutely. So this is a fun question, and I always seem to ask all my guests if it doesn't get asked by one of the listeners, but it's, uh, what is your favorite meal? 
You know, AJ, I tell you, uh, and it came back to me when I was at the the thing in Marshall, Texas. Mm-hmm. I love the vegetarian chili. That yeah. is probably my that, but I like it with kick. I yeah. like it with the kick. And the the guy who won down there, I think he had the the mushrooms in it. There were two of them, but the one that had the mushrooms and I think he had a little cayenne pepper in it. That was just. I, I, and I could eat that all the time. Right. You know, I like to make my, I make a vegetarian chili and I make it with multiple kinds of beans, you know, garbanzo beans, red, deep red kidney beans, all kinds of beans. You know, you can put, it, it's a, one of those foods that you can put all kinds of stuff in it's and just eat on it. It's just a sure. wonderful thing. Well, you know, you're, you're, you live in Chicago and that's where I was born and raised. And, you know, I've been vegan since I was 17. And the one thing I don't really say I miss it, but the one thing I most remember about Chicago is Marshall Fields. And the mo- thing I remember most about Marshall Fields is Frango Mints. <laughs> so, yeah, well, they still make the mints, although Marshall Field isn't there anymore. Right. So they need to come up with a whole food plant based, you know, a really healthy uh, version of that. So Patty wants to know. How close do you think we are for uh, getting hospitals on board with healthier food? And since you are a, a, basically, a, a, you know, somebody working in in this system, what have, have you seen any changes or any interest in going in that direction? Well, there's a there is a hospital, and actually they have a nice video clip. It's called it's uh, the farm at St. Joe's, and this is St. Joe's Hospital in in um, in Michigan. And they took 20 acres of their far, of their land that they plant grass on for their hospital system, and they turned it into a farm. They do a lot of things. And though I don't think they've integrated it into patient care just yet, but they certainly have used it to help change the way that the menus and the foods that are served in the cafeteria are prepared. And they do a lot less frying. Uh, they have a lot more veg- vegetable options than they ever had before, and the patient and the satisfaction has gone up. And they actually, where they can, get that the, 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 the patients that food. I believe that that's the next, the next real place. And, but we've got to do two things. We've got to change the palate of people, yep. and we've got to change the palate of the people who prepare the food for the patients. Sure. And I believe that if, and I had an idea when I was at Mercy Hospital where I practiced for a long time, was to create a unit that was a whole food plant-based and really start people who choose to go on that, who would, who would agree to do it, on it, and measure the differences between them and persons with identical conditions who did not. Terrific. So exercise, you a fan or are you not? <laughs> yes. And I don't, I don't think you need to do a lot of artificial kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not certainly an endurance athlete like these guys that run 100 miles. I have no, I, no, I can't swim, so I can't swim 26 miles either. Mm. But I think that for those who find that something that they look forward to and enjoy, by all means. But you, you're designed to move. And our problem is we don't move enough, and you don't need to do anything fancy. I mean, you, one of the, the simplest things that exercises almost everything that we have is walking. Sure. And we should just, where we can, especially if we're in climates where that can be done, is if you can't do anything else, get out and just walk. Yep. And walk with people because you can walk and talk, and before you know it, you've gone further than you ever thought you could. Tell us a little bit about this radio show you do. How long have you done it? What, when can we listen to it? And what's it about? Uh, my, radio sh- my radio is called The Doctor in the House. I've been doing it on AM 1690 WVON for over 20 years now. Wow. And I do this show really to provide a way to get information about health uh, to the community. And WVON stands for, VON stands for Voice of the Negro. That was what ah. it's, it stood for. And early on, it was one of the, not the only, um, radio show that was dedicated to playing music from African-American artists. It's the station that aired a lot of the music from the Motown era and even before the Motown era, as well as gospel. And it has maintained that tradition for over 50 years now. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing my show there for over 20 years, as I said before. 
And it's every Sunday from 10 to 11. You can get it on the iHeartRadio app, or you can go to WVON.com from 10 to 11 Central Standard Time. Wow. You mentioned um, Voice of the Negro. In your opinion, you know, I was, I was, when I was talking to Dr. Hans Deal, the founder of the CHIP program, he was saying that in sure. his, with, with Latinos, that they were the hardest people that he worked with to get to go plant-based because they came from their country and they saw it more like now they're in this richer country, so they want to eat like us. But of course, we know if you eat like Americans, you become fat and sick like Americans. Do you think the African-American community is embracing the plant-based message or is there some resistance? I think with the people that many of them are on the phone, are on this call, mm-hmm. and they have really, really began to embrace this, uh, some more than others. But I say a step in that direction is better than running in the other one. Sure. So it is, I think that many of them will say that they have had tremendous um, results by eating this way, that they feel better and Many people, you know, they don't eat people in America are don't even have adequate bowel movements. I love Michael Greger's talk on constipation and breast cancer. Uh-huh. Uh, women that have fewer than three bowel movements a week, I believe the numbers are over 40% higher chance of developing breast cancer. Oh. So we know that elimination is important, and the only way you get good elimination is you've got to eat fiber, which only comes from plant-based Plant. foods, and you've got to drink water. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you speak a lot of places. I've had the privilege of speaking with you about five times now, but do you have a website or any way people can find out where you're going to be speaking? Because you're in, in person, you're just, I mean, you're great on the phone too, but in person, you're just, you're just so fun to watch and listen to. So, well, you know what? I'm working on that. Um, there is, I've been working on it for a while. I, you know, I just, I guess some of it is, I just kind of modest about it, I guess. But I I do need to do more, and uh, I like this format, uh, Chef AJ, uh, that we're doing tonight. Yeah, it's great. Uh, And I think that this would be something, and I'll talk to you about this, and I know you've got a TV show. I'm working on on one and working on how we can do it on the Internet. I've got a lot of things that I've recorded from my restart things, and my restart audience that's on this phone tonight has probably wanted to hit me in the head because they haven't put it out there like I need to. And I keep telling them that, that I am, but I'm finally working with a consultant to really get me to get this, you know, to get this done. So That's fantastic. Here, I thought of a name for your TV show, Keeping It Up with Dr. Mason. <laughs> <laughs> so we have time for one more question. I love to ask my guests this. Who inspired you? And it could be somebody in the plant-based movement or just somebody in your life. I always like to know who inspired the people that inspire me. Inspired in what direction? Well, just in general, in life, or, or, or in taking the, your your health in this direction, you know, like Dr. McDougal always says, it was it was Roy Swank, and you know, Do, mm-hmm. Dr. Campbell said it was his father. So, if just just off the top of your head, it could be anything. Who who inspired you the most in life? Well, I would say if I had to say the most in life, it would be a man from a place called Meridian, Mississippi, cool. Mr. Joseph Bingham. He was a man that I worked in the grocery store in our small corner grocery store in our community. He was a man who was first African-American man that was extremely articulate, and it just really fascinated, fascinated me to hear him talk. And he had the small grocery store, and it was in that store I learned how to do everything, from clean the toilets, mop the floor, stock the thing, to the point where I could do – he taught me, he taught me every, everything. He never said, you're too young. If you could do it, he'd say, let's go. And I could – Cut, I couldn't even lift the thing, but I used to, at that time, I would, I had our whole meat case, and I could dress that whole meat case with all the different cuts of meat. I could cut a chicken up in 30, I learned to cut a chicken up in about 30 seconds, um, I, and I learned the produce. I learned every facet of the business to the point when I was 17, I was running the store. Wow. And uh, and he instilled an amazing amount of confidence uh, in me, and then Eventually, he took over the building, and then I managed the, the the laundromat, and I hired people to help clean the laundromat, the building, and all of this before I was 20 years old. So I owe him um, a tremendous debt of gratitude for seeing something in me. And then the second person I would say that put my feet solid on the path to science is my science teacher, Mr. Lewis Wright, uh, 
mm-hmm. who had a special class for us, for any of the students that wanted it when we were in grammar school. And what they did, that they, they never told us where they got information from, but they kept teaching us. And they didn't tell, let us see the books or anything. And Mr. Wright had us learning a college-level chemistry, biochemistry, physiology in seventh grade. And that's because they just, if you could do it, they just said, let's keep going. Wow. So and so those two, those two men were probably the most um, most uh, important in my life. And, of course, my grandfather, who, you know, you need to speak, and for the people on the phone, you need to speak words of encouragement into your children and into Absolutely. your grandchildren. You need to... You need to tell them that they're great people. You need to tell them that they're blessed and that God has a special purpose for them and and they need to really work and strive to try and figure out that was. And that was my grandfather who was an amazing guy. So to the Reverend Dr. Joseph, I mean Reverend Bingham, who was the guy in the grocery store, to Mr. Lewis Wright, and to my uh, grandfather, Mr. Edward Perkins, he really, these are three men that were just, just outstanding and of course i've had some other a lot a lot of people help me along the way for for whom i owe tremendous amount of gratitude and and it's because of this and i and i would end by saying that my inspiration to go to medicine my inspiration to begin to really try and help all of humanity actually came from uh, a man who was was really trying to reach out to those of us, particularly African Americans, where we have more high blood pressure, more diabetes, yep. more cancer, more everything, sure. and he was the first person who came up with a book called "How to Eat to Live," and that was Elijah Muhammad. He came out with that book and nice. wanted to talk about how, and he was the first person who introduced to the into this notion that he said in "How to Eat to Live" that no meat is good for you. Good for him. That's what he said, and he was uh it was through the inspiration of being involved with that that I actually got the inspiration to go to medical school and become a doctor. That's terrific. And what I love so much about you is you're not just a scientist, but you have such a strong spiritual side and a lot of the people shy away from that in our movement. So just thank you for, you know, being who you are because you're just a delight. I'm proud to call you my friend. You're top of the list of people that I like to work with and I'm just so glad that I know you and thank you for uh being on the call tonight. You were terrific. Well, thank you, and I thank all of your our listening audience, and I thank all of my folks I sent out the email to, and I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you being there, supporting what's going on, and, and I want you to be evangelists for what we're <laughs> doing, and, and God bless each and every one of you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and thank you all for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ. And I make healthy taste delicious. Thank you, Dr. Mason. And good You're welcome. Take care.